My name is Bruce Gagnon. I'm the coordinator of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space, which is made up of 157 affiliate groups all over the world on every continent. And we're working to stop the nuclearization and weaponization of space. Actually, the U.S. Uh, government began working on space weapons right after World War II when the former Nazi rocket scientists that built the V-1 and V-2 rockets for Hitler were brought to the United States under a program called Operation Paperclip. Werner von Braun, the rocket genius for Hitler, along with 150 of his rocket team, were brought to the United States with 100 of the V-2 rockets that were used to terrorize the cities of London and Paris and Brussels. They were first set up in New Mexico at White Sands Missile Range, and then they went on to Huntsville, Alabama. And actually, the space weapons development began at that time. Major General Walter Dornberger, the guy that recruited von Braun for Hitler, was also brought over under this Operation Paper Clip. And uh, actually, he was the first to have the idea of ballistic missile defense and the first to come up with the plan for orbiting battle stations that are today under development as the space-based laser. So since the Eisenhower administration, when they first began working on these, to today they've spent about $120 billion. So Reagan didn't really create Star Wars. It wasn't really uh, Edward Teller's idea. And in fact, it was the Nazis that were brought over that uh, created this, this whole dream of putting weapons in space and having the United States control space and the Earth below. But, but uh, it is clear, though, that Ronald Reagan helped spike it up, helped reinvigorate the whole program, gave it a uh, major uh, thrust, and major, gave it major ideological uh, support, and got the money flowing in a big way again for the program. When Bill Clinton became president of the United States, he held a press conference to say that SDI, or Reagan's Strategic Defense Initiative, was dead. And he said that the $3.5 billion for research and development that was annually going into that program would be finished. But what uh, Clinton didn't say was that he created a new organization called the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization within the Pentagon. And he moved the $3.5 billion from SDI, Reagan's SDI, into the new Ballistic Missile Defense Organization. And they continued on with the same research and development through all the Clinton years, the eight years of Bill Clinton. There are various layers of this whole Star Wars system. Uh, one is a thing called theater missile defense, TMD. The idea of theater missile defense is you forward deploy the systems surrounding so-called rogue states so that you can knock out their missile, missiles immediately after they're launched in what's called their boost phase. And so theater missile defense would be deployed in three different ways. In the oceans, Aegis destroyers would launch missiles and knock out countries uh, missiles immediately after they're launched. The Army would run gr ground-based launchers driven around on trucks, and then the Air Force would get into the act with what's called the Airborne Laser, a converted Boeing 747 with a laser beam on its nose, flying 24 hours a day, seven days a week, surrounding these rogue states. And then uh, the next layer up is what they call mid-course, hitting missiles uh, in the mid-course after they've been launched. And then, of course, there's the uh, high-altitude systems, the space-based systems, where the space-based laser and other technologies like that would actually orbit the Earth and knock out uh, other countries' satellites as, as well as hitting missiles in flight. So there's various layers of the system now being developed, and the hope is that uh, they will get some of these various systems to work. They understand that they're not going to be able to make all the technologies work, but the reason why they're working on so many of the technologies is to uh, come, be able to come up with various options, and also the more technologies that are being operated uh, today, the more research and development dollars that flow into the system. And so I think one of the major issues for the peace movement today is to end the research and development spending for Star Wars development. There's no doubt that the so-called missile defense is actually a Trojan horse. And the reason why I say that is because I don't believe that it has anything at all to do with defense. It's sold to the American people and to the rest of the world as a defensive system, really in order to justify the funding 
the Bush administration and the militarists know they can't come to the American people and say, give us hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars so that we can build a system to have the United States control space, dominate space, deny other countries access to space, and ultimately for the United States to be the master of space. And so they dress it up as a defensive system in order to sell it to everyone. The ABM treaty that we have with Russia that Bush has now announced that we're going to walk away from really is a limited treaty because it's only between the United States and Russia. And if we really want to ban weapons in space, we have to have a world treaty, a treaty that involves all the countries of the world and get everyone to sign on to this idea that we won't put weapons in space. The Outer Space Treaty of 1967 from the United Nations really is the kind of model that we want to have, although it's very limited in its definitions of what can and cannot be done today in space. For example, the Outer Space Treaty only bans weapons of mass destruction in space. And so the Pentagon would say that the space-based laser, for example, is not a weapon of mass destruction. And so we need a broader definition, a treaty with a broader definition, saying that we would ban any weapons in space and not only weapons of mass destruction. And so that's why, therefore, we're now promoting this idea that we need to create a whole new treaty. And there have been resolutions brought to the floor of the United Nations General Assembly in the last couple of years by Canada and Russia and China. And there have been votes taken on these. And the United States and Israel, uh, by and large, have been the only countries saying that they don't support the development of these treaties. In fact, the official position in the United States is there's no problem. Therefore, there's no need to negotiate a new global ban on weapons in space. I think the most important thing of all about Bush's walking away from the ABM Treaty is the signal to the world that the United States will not be bound by international legal documents, that we are moving into this new era where the United States uh, will dominate the world and that we will not be restricted in any way from international treaties. And I think the rest of the world is slowly beginning to understand that they must be more vocal uh, about uh, the way the United States is in fact becoming a rogue state. Russia and China have both said if the United States moves forward with such a program that they will be forced ultimately to find ways to inundate or overwhelm any so-called Star Wars shield which of course only means that we will have a whole new arms race on our hands, that life on Earth will become more unstable, and that our children's future will be less safe. Now we're told that a Star Wars shield will protect us and make us more safe, but in the end the reality is that it will make life on this Earth less safe. Throughout Europe and again Canada, the traditional allies in the United States have been very vocal about uh, this program and how in fact it, it will create a new arms race. Uh, but you know, uh, the United States is now developing strategies by which to uh, circumvent or, or neutralize their concern. And one of those strategies, frankly, is to have American corporations like Lockheed Martin and TRW and Raytheon and Boeing that are the largest recipients of Star Wars funding to begin to give subcontracts to weapons corporations in the European countries, for example, in order to get them on board, hoping that that will begin to neutralize European governmental opposition to this program. The whole goal of the Global Network, our whole agenda, has actually been to create a new consciousness about space amongst the people around the world. We think ultimately that the peace movement in the United States cannot stop this program by ourselves, and that we must build a global movement. And therefore that's been our work to create in, in countries and continents around the world organizations that are helping to build a new consciousness about how we view space, about protecting space from this bad seed of war and greed and environmental degradation. And so today we now have, as I said, affiliates all over the world who are working on this program. Uh, who are holding demonstrations, who are holding conferences, who are going to their leaders to begin to educate them and educate the people in their countries about the need to ban weapons in space. And I think that uh, each year we've seen progress on this as each year we hold an international day of protest against the militarization of space. 
And uh, from one year to the next, we've been doubling the number of activities around the world. And so this is actually beginning to take root. Uh, and I think as that happens, as it grows organically, we're going to see a, a growing and growing a new consciousness around the world amongst the people about space. And this, in the end, will create a constituency that will begin to have political power over time to change this whole process. Even before September 11th, the sad truth of the matter is that the Democratic Party was already in bed with the Republican Party in terms of supporting Star Wars. They are, the Democrats believe in a robust research and development program for Star Wars. And they were prepared to give Bush almost everything he wanted in the fiscal year 2002 for Star Wars. After September 11th, the Democrats rolled over and gave Bush everything he wanted. But there's very little difference, actually, between the Democrats and the Republicans on this issue. The Democrats are in favor of robust research and development. The Democrats are in favor of deployment of theater missile defense systems around the world. Some leaders within the Democratic Party have said they're opposed to the deployment of national missile defense. But the truth is, at this moment, there is no system to deploy. There is, has been no technological breakthrough that would allow the United States to deploy national missile defense. So for the Democrats, it's a safe position to take because there's nothing to deploy. But in terms of spending the money and deploying the elementary systems, theater missile defense systems, the Democrats are in step, in lockstep with the Republicans on that issue. I think since September 11th, those that were in favor of Star Wars have used that incident as a way to make their case. Those who were opposed have used it to show that uh, any Star Wars system would never have protected the Twin Towers in New York from attack by those airplanes. But what's really important is how do the middle uh, of Americans feel about that issue? How did September 11th impact their thinking? And I believe, as I've traveled around this country and around the world since September 11th, what I see is that people are more open now to understanding that an escalation of the arms race is not in any way going to protect us. And in fact, it's going to make life more unstable. And I think people are getting that, are really understanding that. And I think that is for our side, for those of us who oppose a new arms race, it's a significant step. Star Wars, in the end, is going to do two things. Number one, it's going to raid our national treasury. And so how will we pay for the hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars for Star Wars? And there's only one answer. Cuts. Cuts in education. Cuts in health care. Cuts in environmental programs. Cuts in housing programs. All the things we need to make our life better here on this planet Earth. Those programs will be cut in order to pay for Star Wars. So, number one, it's going to cost us our future. And number two, Star Wars will be destabilizing. It will make our life more insecure on this earth because it will create a new arms race. It will move technologies into space. They're talking about putting uh, nuclear reactors on board the space-based lasers to provide power. So imagine them uh, participating in war with space-based lasers and having those uh, nuclear reactors on board those lasers fall back to Earth and burn up when they hit Earth gravity and spread plutonium globally to be ingested by the people of the Earth for generation after generation after generation. How could anyone say that that will bring us more security? In the end, I think, we really have one of two choices. We can either try to arm the world and create such an arms race that it uh, destroys uh, the environment, that it destroys our national treasury, or we can move towards true peace, towards recognizing that negotiation, reductions of weapon systems, uh, uh, social justice in this country and with, uh, with countries around the world, a uh, sense of justice and equality in working with other countries. In the end, I think this is the only vision that it will bring us peace and security. I think the most important reason that we should oppose Star Wars research and development is that it's a waste. It's a waste of our intellectual capital. It's a waste of our hard-earned tax dollars. 
It's a waste of our children's future when we know we all need to be putting our energy, our research and development, our mental energy, our hearts into developing solar technologies and wind technology and cleaning up the earth and making this beautiful planet a livable place to live. In the end, I think Star Wars interrupts that positive process. It interrupts the hope for the future. And so we must understand that the dreams that we have for our children and for this beautiful planet of ours, this home of ours, will be interrupted by this idea of researching and developing and deploying weapons in space. I don't believe that a tremendous focus on the technology is the key issue. Ultimately, this system is not about defense in the first place. It's not about defending us from attack. It's about developing offensive capabilities for warfare in space and from space to the earth below. That's what the system's really about. That's what the Pentagon talks about in their vision for 2020 of the Space Command. They talk about controlling space, dominating space, denying other countries access to space, the United States being the master of space. Those are all offensive uh, ideas, offensive strategies. And so it's not about defense. And so I think it's one thing uh, to create technology for defense and it's another thing to create technology for offense, for hitting first, for first strike capability. And those are the things I think that they're planning to do. So I believe if you give the Pentagon enough time and you give them enough money and they're working on enough systems that in the end they will be able to create some technologies that give them offensive capability for space weapons. And I think that's the part of it we really need to focus on because that's the place they're going. That's what their plan is and that is what we really must talk to the American people about. What I think the Space Command document vision for 2020 is all about is laying out the, the uh, the long-range plan, laying out the, their vision for where they want to be going in the future. Uh, you know, I, I think the most important thing is to look at it like Columbus. When Christopher Columbus went out looking for the New World, uh, after he discovered, so to speak, the New World, the first thing he did was come back to Queen Isabella. And Queen Isabella of Spain then began the hundred-year process of creating the Spanish Armada to protect Spain's new interests and investments in the New World. And so the Space Command, really, its job is going to be to essentially create a fortress surrounding the planet Earth. All warfare on Earth today is coordinated from space. So if you control space, you literally control the planet below. And from there, once you control space, you also control who has access to the moon and to Mars and to the other planetary bodies, where today NASA is finding out that there is gold on asteroids, there is magnesium and cobalt and uranium on Mars, there's helium-3 and water on the moon. And someday, NASA says, corporations will move off the planet and begin to mine these planetary bodies. And so what the Space Command is really telling us is that they intend to create a parallel military highway between the Earth and these planetary bodies so that the United States military will control who has access to these places so they can decide which corporations will go and do this profitable mining the sky in future years. And so uh, it's very important that we also update our thinking and understand that they are now talking about literally moving warfare into the heavens beyond the Earth orbit out into space to control other planets as they intend to control this planet Earth as well. In the year 2001, the Pentagon announced the development of the space-based laser. The, just the test program, they say, will cost over $30 billion. And today, at the Stennis Missile Center, NASA's Stennis Missile Center in the swamps of Mississippi, they're working on the space-based laser. They're working on it at Lockheed Martin's plant in Sunnyvale, California, in the Bay Area. The idea is to deploy a constellation of somewhere between 18 to 48 of these space-based lasers orbiting the Earth, powered with nuclear reactors, knocking out other countries' satellites, and hitting targets on the Earth below. 
This is the real Star Wars plan. The whole idea of missile defense is just a Trojan horse to get the foot in the door to build the technologies for the real Star Wars. Theater missile defense, they're now talking about deploying it in the Middle East and in the Asian Pacific region, particularly in the Asian Pacific region. The United States now says they want to deploy theater missile defense in Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Australia, and on ships and planes throughout the coast surrounding China. Now imagine how China will respond when the United States deploys theater missile defense right along their coastal borders surrounding them. And now since September 11th, with the war in Central Asia going on, the United States now has set up bases in uh, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan. And if you look at the map, you see the proximity to China. China, these Central Asian countries are right along China's inland border, giving the United States essentially the capability to surround China with theater missile defense. Of course, this is going to be very provocative and will force China to expand its own military capability. And I think this is the true intention of the United States. We want to force China to do that. And it's very simple. What is the number one industrial export of America today? And of course the answer is weapons. And when you have your number one industrial export, what is your global marketing strategy? Well, of course the global marketing strategy for America's number one industrial export is chaos, instability, warfare. The more unstable a region is, the more weapons we sell to countries throughout that region. And so today I believe the plan is to surround China, have them build more weapons, which will then create a regional arms race that the United States will profit from, and, and at the same time have a new justification for Star Wars. You know, there's no way that the average citizen can really compete with the massive millions and millions of dollars that these weapons corporations are pumping in to the political process. Today, one of the reasons I think that the Democratic Party has become so supportive of Star Wars research and development and support deployment of theater missile defense, for example, is because they are major recipients of the donations from these multinational weapons corporations who stand to make enormous profits from Star Wars. And so we now find that these weapons corporations have essentially locked up the political system. And I think it's no coincidence then that they're getting these uh, massive contracts from the very politicians that they're also giving funding to. And now these same people working for Lockheed Martin and other weapons corporations have been put in the highest levels of the uh, Defense Department, the Department of War. And so today, it's no coincidence that they are moving massive amounts of money uh, to these same corporations that they came from, to Lockheed Martin, TRW, Boeing, and Raytheon. There's no doubt about that uh, President Eisenhower's warning to us to beware of the power of the military-industrial complex rings so true today, more true than ever. And in fact, we've really lost our democracy in the United States to these people who are now promoting global non-ending warfare and profiting from it at the same time. I don't think that the multinational weapons corporations are at all concerned about global peace. In fact, I think global peace would be the worst thing that could ever happen to them. They stand to make more money if things are in chaos. All you have to do is look at the Middle East as an example. Today, the United States is supplying weapons to Egypt, Israel, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait, uh, and a whole uh, long list of these countries throughout the Middle East and the places in chaos. And so now the plan is to move that into the Asian Pacific region. So the more things are bad, the more they plan to make money. Recently, I learned that Lockheed Martin, who uh, built the spy plane that China brought down last year on Henan Island, Today, Lockheed Martin is building a naval reconnaissance system on Henan Island, making money off both sides of the street right now. And so if a new arms race can be created in that Asian Pacific region, companies like Lockheed Martin will make massive profits. The major role for Vandenberg Air Force Base 
as Cape Canaveral in Florida, is to launch missiles. And these missiles that are launched, these military rockets, are really carrying two different things. Number one, they're carrying satellites that will put in place the whole Star Wars infrastructure that will allow the United States to target, to identify, to see, to hear, and to target attacks all over the world. And then, of course, the other launches are the Star Wars tests, the National Missile Defense tests at $100 million each that go up and try to test out these weapon systems. At that action on October of 2000, we had uh, 350 people that came to the gate to protest. And what happened was, what was most important, I think, was what happened inside the base. Even in the days before we came, we know that a letter was sent around the base to all the different squadrons telling them that the protest was going to be there and to notify the uh, GIs not to go near the front gate. We know that it was reported in the newspaper of the base not to go near the gate. The people in the nearby housing area should avoid the gate. And so people were warned to stay away. And of course what that did for days on end was create a discussion inside the barracks, inside the chow hall, inside the homes on the base housing area about this protest and why we were protesting and what we were protesting. And this is what we want to do. This is our goal is to create that discussion, that reflection. And I can guarantee you that there will be people inside of that base who uh, this discussion will unleash a reflective chain reaction that will literally change their lives. And then on that day when we went to the base, and there was a line of riot uh, prepared military police lined up to prevent us from coming inside the gate. Their hearts, too, were impacted by our presence, by our nonviolent presence at that base. And then those that, uh, as we approached the line and they arrested us and put us on the bus and they drove us to the jail and, and, and interrogated us inside the jail and then drove us back uh, to the nearby town at the end of the evening and dumped us out onto the street. Their hearts were also touched by this whole process. And one by one, and one by one, we begin changing people's heart and we begin opening people's mind to us and to our message. And this is what it's all about. This is what Gandhi and King taught us, that if we ultimately want to change the bigger policy, we have to begin to meet the people who participate in the process and offer them opportunities to change and grow. And when we went to trial, I'll never forget, there were five or six people from the military there to testify against us. And I went and handed them each a book about what we were doing, describing our intentions, and they took it. They didn't say no, but they took the book. And I guarantee they read the book, and I hope that their hearts again were touched, and I believe they were. The whole strategy of the Global Network has been to go to the communities where they're developing Star Wars technologies, where they're doing the research and development, where they're doing the testing, and to get people to go to these places and begin to protest and take steps over the line to actually be arrested to challenge this whole program. Because I think it's really important that uh, communities that are heavily involved in these programs to put weapons in space begin to wrestle with them over the dinner table and as the workers are lying in bed at night to be really wrestle with these moral and ethical questions surrounding this whole uh, arms race in space. And so I think our protests at these places are much more important than we realize. When I was in the Air Force during the Vietnam War, stationed at Travis Air Force Base in California, a military airlift base for the war in Vietnam, there were the few protesters outside our base that created such a dynamic inside the gate that my life was changed forever. That is where I became a peace activist because of the few people outside the base every weekend. And so uh, today now, all over the world, we are now having this happen at U.S. bases and weapons installations and Star Wars installations literally around the world. We now have people going to them and really creating this rippling effect of a global debate about S Star Wars. I think as we remember the Nuremberg trials at the end of World War II that told us that ultimately every soldier, every person, every citizen is responsible for what their government does. 
And that's an important lesson for us. As we look now today and see that our government is planning to control the heavens, start a whole new arms race, each of us, no matter where we are in this society, whether we're a GI in the military or whether we're just a citizen taxpayer, each of us are responsible for what our government is doing, I think morally and by law. And so I think we all have to search our hearts and really begin to understand that with that responsibility comes a need for action. We cannot just allow them to take our tax dollars and prepare for a new arms race in space that could ultimately destroy this earth. The Kwajalein Atoll in the Pacific and the Marshall Islands has historically been a place where the United States launches missiles in order to uh, practice various technologies and today they're involved in this whole missile defense program by uh, act, uh, by launching what they call the hit to kill mechanism the actual kill vehicle of this missile defense system it's a real tragic situation in Kwajalein where for years the United States has essentially colonized this island moved the people onto this tiny tiny sub island if you will where there are literally thousands of them living in squalid conditions, packed in like sardines in a can. And while the United States takes the very best lands within the Marshall Islands chain and uses this as a launch facility and has a wonderfully groomed housing area for the U.S. military personnel with the very best facilities involved, it's the classic case of colonialism. It's the classic case of domination. And just as that domination goes on today, it's a reflection of the kind of domination that Star Wars is about protecting and advancing around the world, giving the United States this kind of control and domination of literally the Earth and space above us. There's no doubt that the expenditure of our tax dollars for Star Wars research and development is an issue that should be touching everyone's heart across America. That no matter what color you are or what age you are or where you are in this life, uh, you need to be concerned about Star Wars because it's taken money out of your future. Money that would go for your children's education. Money that would go to clean up your neighborhood from toxic contamination. Money that would go towards health care for your mother or your grandmother. Uh, these are issues that affect all of us, no matter who we are or where we live. And so ultimately, Star Wars is an issue that connects all of our issues because it steals from all of our, all of our future. Ultimately, I think this campaign against Star Wars has to be integrated with all the other campaigns and all the other organizations uh, that are working today. For example, uh, this Star Wars issue is really about corporate globalization. It's really about having the military, uh, the Space Command, become the arm by which the multinational corporations rule the world. And so Star Wars is not some separate issue. It's the military arm of corporate globalization. Star Wars, again, is taking money from the uh, future of our children. And so it's connected to social justice issues. And so as we uh, build this campaign against Star Wars, we've been working very hard to show the integration, the links, the connections, uh, the deadly connections between Star Wars and all these other issues. And I think that uh, people in various movements also need to begin to show how their movements are connected to Star Wars because uh, the effort to uh, build a multinational corporation control around the world can only succeed the corporate globalists can only succeed if they have a military arm just like we've now seen in Afghanistan how the military is being used to deliver a country to Unical and the other US multinational oil corporations so they can run pipelines through Central Asia to benefit them and so uh, I think the movements on these other issues need to show these links as well. The most important thing we all can do to stop Star Wars is to go after the research and development dollars. If we can cut off the funds, this program dies. It's the air supply. If we can close down research and development, it's finished. 
And so more important even than deployment of systems is cutting off the funds. And to do that, in all honesty, we have to deal with the Democratic Party. The, the peace movement has to be able to understand that it must come at odds with the Democratic Party, who today supports the development, the research for Star Wars. And so that means for some people going up against politicians that you consider your allies, because right now the Democrats are in bed with the Republicans on Star Wars. And until we deal with that, we're not going to get anywhere. So we have to delink the peace movement from the Democratic Party. The peace movement should not be controlled by any political party. When the day comes that the peace movement is a truly independent movement, not affiliated with any political party, not under the control of any political party, but able to criticize every political party, then I think we can have success. I think, I think ultimately the answer to our success will be our ability to tell the truth, to not shade anything, to be able to go to the American people and say, look, this is what our government is doing. These are their intentions. They want to use your tax dollars. They want to cut education funding for your children. They want to cut your grandmother's health care. And they want to use this funds to en enrich themselves, these big corporations, and also to move the arms race into the heavens so that they can literally control and dominate the earth. And to show them the actual documents coming out of the Space Command and from the weapons corporations that are available today to show them in their own words what their plans are. And I think when we do that, people will find it very hard to walk away from that reality. And even if they might want to deny it, deep in their heart of hearts, they'll know it's true. And when they lay in bed at night, they'll struggle with it. And when they look at their children's faces in the morning at the breakfast table, they'll struggle with it because they'll know it's true. And they will, in the end, have to deal with it. I grew up in a military family, actually a Republican family. My first organizing experience was when I was 16 working on the Nixon campaign. So I've always considered myself a patriot. And it was when I was in the Air Force that uh, during the Vietnam War that my life got changed. I really began to understand what my country was really about and what it was doing. And I think that uh, as we give people experiences, as people become involved in these movements and they learn more, Ultimately, it's education. We, as we learn more what's going on, we begin to break away from the system. We begin to lose faith in all the nonsense that we've been led to believe over the years. And I think it's in that process that we, became new, we become new people. We become new citizens. We become new patriots, a different kind of patriot, a global patriot, if you will, a universal patriot where we begin to see that everyone is the same. Everywhere on this earth, people love their children just as much as you and I do. People want to eat. They want to be safe. They want to have clean water and clean air. And they want to gaze up at the moon and the stars on a clear night and still wonder about those same things that our relatives did for thousands of years. Does God exist? What happens when you die? And I think it is in all of that that we become true citizens of the universe. And to me, that's the consciousness that our age calls upon us to put out and to begin to understand that that is where our survival will come from, not from weapons, and not from war, but from a new consciousness about who we really are as people and as living beings and as souls in this universal age. And I think people are coming around to that. I think they're understanding that. And so our work in this movement to keep space for peace is just another part of that whole movement to be, uh, to be uh, understanding, to be uh, human beings, to understand what it means to be a human being. And I think that is where our victory will come in. Last year I had an email from a women's group in, in Azerbaijan. They asked me to send them 40 copies of our newsletter. They said they were having a national women's meeting and they wanted to discuss Star Wars. And I realized that when women in Azerbaijan are sitting around in a circle 
and talking about U.S. plans for control and domination of space that we've already won, that our ultimate goal is to create a global debate and a global discussion, a democratic debate, a people's debate about what we should do in space. And the fact of the matter is, it's happening. And it's something that cannot be stopped. And so each and every day, as more and more people come to this issue, and as more and more people begin to think about it, their consciousness expands, and this debate expands, multifold. It's going to places now, literally everywhere on this planet. And that, in the end, is a power that no one can stop.